Hey, this is Phil Diaz. I'm the pastor at Greencastle Church of the Nazarene, and this is our podcast. I want to thank you for joining us today. It's my prayer that God would use this podcast to speak to your life right where you're at. I pray it also builds your faith and helps give you perspective on how God can work, move, and transform your life. Enjoy the message. Amen. Well, today uh, we are here in the house of the Lord. It's good to be with you all here today. Uh, good to be with our EFAM watching online. Um, the message title, as you can see, it's this. It's called Your Helplessness Without the Help of the Holy Spirit. It's a very long title, and uh, there's a lot to unpack today. So we're going to go ahead and dig into that today. Let me ask you this. Has there ever been a time in your life where you just felt completely helpless? Raise your hand. Anybody? Okay. Most people. All right. Um, it could have been something simple like needing something off of a really top shelf. You felt helpless. You had to get someone else to help you. Um, it could be a technology question on how to log into Facebook so you can see the mobile sanctuary. Uh, it could be understanding your kids' homework on the Google Chromebooks. Isn't that right, actually? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, for some of us, it could be even something like going on a diet, losing weight. Um, you know, it gets hard to do that on your own sometimes. For some of us, it could have been battling an addiction or changing our mindset and just feeling completely and entirely helpless within that pursuit. One time, a long time ago, there was a time where I felt completely and utterly helpless. I was getting off of work at Jasper, and I was going down that famous Highway 257, and it runs through Otwell, which is a little itty-bitty town. And when I get to Otwell, there's this little blue car just decides to slide right in front of me. And I didn't think too much of it, because that happens actually quite a bit. I pray for those people. but. As I was behind this car, I was noticing that the driving of this vehicle was more than often just kind of like pulling out in front of me. It was um, doing some pretty wild driving. It was going all the way to the left, all the way to the right, all the way back to the left, all the way back to the right. Now, this was not a, this was, it's a one way lane on each lane. So when you cross over to the left, you got cars coming at you this way, and then you're swerving this way, of course, you're, you're going in the right direction. Uh, and, and they were doing this for a while. So I was trying to call the police, but on 257, you are lucky if you have a bar of cell phone reception. So it's very hard to kind of make calls or get calls at certain times, depending on how that works in that area. But I was very concerned about um, this particular driver. And so I was following this car, and as they were going left, they were going right, um, sure enough, something happened that I had never imagined happening or ever seeing in my life before. So as they swerved, now to the right to get back into the right lane, there's a patch where there is a metal bar because underneath of this bar is a giant ditch. It's full of rock. It's oh, probably about at least 40 feet, 50 feet down. It's, it's a good way down. The car was accelerating at full speed, probably at least 60 to 70 miles an hour. It hit through the bar and it was just flying. I mean, I had never seen a car fly before. I thought I had to wait till the future. <laughs> And so I'm driving and I'm processing, but I'm not processing. Like, they went through that. They're flying in the air. What is going on? Um, and then it just fell in this giant ditch. And I was shocked. I was stunned. And it was just me on the road with this car. So I pull over and I get out of my car and there's this voice that I heard. So I followed this voice. It was a fragile young woman, covered in blood, screaming for help. Now, I'm not a paramedic. <laughs> she was in really bad shape. 
And as I tried to help her, she was very badly damaged. And she was laying in such a way to where I couldn't really move her by myself because I didn't feel comfortable because her leg was bent in a way it probably shouldn't be. <laughs> She's screaming out in pain. And then she drops this bomb. Where is my I had never felt in that moment more helpless than in my entire life. But today, and the message for today is maybe for some of you out there that have faced a similar situation and you just feel completely helpless. Today we're going to be in the Word. Let's turn to Zechariah. We're going to be in chapter 4. We're going to be in verses 1 through 10. And so today, the message is for those that feel helpless. But I pray that this word today encourage you in your faith and in your walk. So let's stand for the reading of this word today from the Lord. Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. This is what the word of the Lord says. It says, And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me like a man who is awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold, with a bowl on top of it, and seven lamps on it, with seven lamps on each of the lamps that are on top of it. And there are two olives by it, one on the right of the bowl, and the other is on the left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And then the angel who talked with me answered and said this to me. Do you not know what these are? <laughs> I said, No, my Lord. Verse 6. And then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great one? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying that by the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundations of this house. His hand shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord which range through the whole earth. Let us bow our heads for the receiving of this word today. Dear Heavenly Father, and Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, today I ask that you help open our hearts and minds to this word. This is not an easy word, but I believe that this is a necessary word for us to hear today. And so Lord, help me to speak your word, to preach your word, to help unpack this word in a way to where it makes sense, but mostly to where it's encouragement and help for us to also be the spiritual sustenance we need to eat today from your table. I pray this word be filling within our hearts, and I pray for your Holy Spirit, Lord, to come anew. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. 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 You guys may be seated. All right. The book of Zechariah is an Old Testament book that uses dreams, prophecy, vivid imagery, history, and just generally really weird stuff to make its points. How many of you have ever read this book before? Okay, a few hands have gone up. Yeah, uh, this is not the easiest book to read through, but I think there's a great word for us in this book today. This book is concerned with the rebuilding of the temple and is also concerned about the coming of the Messiah and the New Jerusalem. And so it's not a book that we probably read as often because how it goes about talking about these things, it does it in a very ADHD way. It, it, it goes from one thing to completely something different to something different. And it especially does that in the first eight chapters. And then in the last part of the book, it really does focus more on Jesus and the coming kingdom. 
But in this passage that we're reading about today, just to kind of help you unpack and how it's going to work today, there was a fourth vision that had happened, and this we're getting into is the fifth vision. Okay, so someone say fifth vision. The fifth vision. So it's unfolding in this passage in chapter four. It's speaking of the dignity and significance of the high priest. And this passage speaks about this joint glory of Zerubbabel and also this other guy whose name was Joshua. And these guys were the civil heads of the Jewish community at this time. To give you an idea of where this fits, Israel was in exile and now they're coming out of exile. And so they are kind of in this in-between stage where they're getting ready to build a temple. But the prophet in this passage made this passage as an oracle for Zerubbabel himself. The prophet sees this. Um, let's see if I can get my graphic up. Just because it makes a little bit more sense. Um, but maybe not much. It's my illustration. Um, he sees this. So he sees a seven-branched golden lampstand with an inexhaustible supply of oil. Above the stand is a bowl, and to the right and to the left are two olive trees. The trees feed the bowl through two spouts, and the bowl supplies olive oil to the lampstand through seven golden pipes. The lampstand, this is where it gets a little bit better, <laughs> the lampstand is a symbol of the restored Jewish community in which God is present. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Now, the two olive trees which supply the lamps help represent Zerubbabel and Joshua as channels of divine grace into the people of Israel. Everyone gets that, right? Right? Okay, you guys are much better than me. I had to read that like at least ten times. Okay, so we're going to go a little deeper. Now, the lampstand, it does represent, of course, the community of Israel, but in a deeper sense, it also represents a symbol of the divine presence of God in the midst of this community. And the community of the Jews was to center its life around the worship of God. Yet, with the temple being near its completion, in this vision, God was trying to speak to the Israelites about not putting all of their trust in the completion of a building. Their trust was to be put not into the building itself, but into the life that would fill that building known as the temple. Amen? Amen. You know, sometimes we get so focused on the building, we forget about the life that needs to fill this building. Amen? Amen. So God was speaking to this even in the Old Testament. The seven lights are symbolic of the eyes of Jehovah. And the two olive trees on the right side and the candlestick, of course, um, help represent uh, Zechariah, or I'm sorry, Zerubbabel. Joshua. In the 11th passage, Zechariah asks this question, and he begins to enlarge on what this means. And so the two branches of the olive trees are beside the two golden pipes. The angel's puzzled about this question as well. He's like, don't you know what these mean? I mean, did you guys know what this meant before I preached on it? Yeah. So Zechariah was in the same position as you were just a few minutes ago. So he had to like ask it again. How many of you like to ask questions again just to make sure you get it right? Okay, yeah, that's me too. Okay, so the prophet spoke plainly. These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord and the whole earth. And although he doesn't name them by names, uh, most scholars agree it's Joshua and Zerubbabel, the religious and civil leaders of this community. The two olive trees which provide an unfailing supply of oil to the lamps are the two anointed heads of Israel, and these men are channels of that divine grace. But here is where the good part is. The good part is in knowing that the fountain where it is filled, it is God himself. Give him praise for that. Amen. Amen. So in an entirety, this book is all about getting right with God. That's what it's about. You need to get right. You want to build a temple? We need to get right with God. You want to build a temple? The people need to get right with God. We want to build this thing? We need to get right with God. And, and that's the book in a nutshell. 
But the words of our text today are designed to encourage our hearts. As they're speaking to the Derubable, I believe they also speak to us. Which, by the way, do you know who Zerubbabel was related to later on down the line? Jesus. He's in his lineage. And so this is what makes this, I think, interesting as well. How many of you have ever tried to go it alone spiritually? You try to just do it on your own without having any sort of great effect. Amen? Yeah, I have. And so today's message is for anyone who's ever tried to do that. Anyone who's ever tried to accomplish heaven's work without relying on the Holy Spirit. Anyone who's ever tried to accomplish heaven's work with their own abilities, their own agendas, and their own strength, and it all ends up in despair. This is a message for you. A great missionary to China and later to Korea once said this, you cannot do God's work without God's power. Amen? Let me say that again. You cannot do God's work without God's power. Because in the text, in Zechariah, chapter 4, verse 6, it says this, it's not by might, it is not by power, but it is by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And so today, this is a reminder that it is not by our might, and it is not by our power, but it's by the spirit that enables us to do the work of the Lord. Let me ask you something. Have you ever been trying to develop your Christian character without the help of the Holy Spirit? (laughs) I'm a good person. I I got some good morals in me. That's great. But without the help of God and the Holy Spirit in your life, you've just got morality, which isn't a bad thing. But it's not the best that it can be. Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever tried to teach? It could be a Bible class. It could have been the youth group. A Sunday school class at some point. Whatever it might have been. How many of you have ever tried to teach a class like that and never been dependent upon the power of the Spirit to speak to those in your class? Huh? It makes a difference. Let me ask you this. Have you ever seen yourself trying to speak to those who don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior without a sincere dependence on the Holy Spirit to give you the words to say? I mean, I've had people try to witness to me, and I wanted to pull them aside and say, listen, I love and appreciate you, but if you said it this way, it will go a lot farther than if you said it this way. And I think what it is, is it not necessarily because I didn't feel maybe the Lord speaking to me in that, but it's just because when we do things without the Spirit's help, we end up doing it on our own will and our own mind and our own power and our own strength. And it's not by the Spirit. And much of the weakness and failure of God's people can be traced directly to the fact that we don't depend on God enough. Yeah. Yeah. We don't depend on Him enough. It's not that we don't know He's not there. It's do we depend on God enough. So I have three points I want to give to you today to help illustrate our need help. So my first point is this. Without the Holy Spirit's help, you are helpless. <laughs> and the future is also hopeless. So let me unpack that for you. In our passage today, Zerubbabel was helpless and he couldn't accomplish his purpose. Well, his purpose was to help rebuild the temple. That's what he was purposed to do. But he could never do that on his own. I mean, the temple was not going to be built by an army. Although he could command an army, it wasn't going to get built by an army. The temple wasn't going to be built solely by him, brick by brick, mortar by mortar. The temple was going to be built when the people of God, when the people of Israel understood that they had to be made right with the God that they worshipped and they served. They had to be able to walk with God. They had to be able to talk with God. They also had to experience with the Lord Almighty. Amen. Amen. And so God's reminding the people that their future, it could be ending up repeating their past. Because remember, they just came out of exile. They just came out of bondage. They came out of crying, oh Lord, save us. Help put us back together. And he did. But they could so easily go astray and go right back into that. 
our helplessness always puts us in a position to be helped. And that's not always a bad thing. Sometimes we, I think in our lives, we, we don't want to be helpless. So we do everything ourselves. But really, we need to be humble in our lives. And we need to not do it by our own strength and power, but it needs to be by the Holy Spirit. There's also no human power can enable the prophet to accomplish his divine mission. Oftentimes in life we experience great failure and our lives can be unfruitful if we attempt to try to do the work of God without the work of the Holy Spirit. I've seen many times <laughs> I, and I, just, I think the Sunday school class has come for me for some reason but like I've seen many times where like They've had these Sunday school classes and the teacher's like, yeah, I didn't prepare, I didn't read, I just kind of got up there and talked about some stuff and I think it went really good. What, what'd you talk about? I don't know, I don't know what I talked about. It's something about Jesus or something. Well, that's great. But, but, <laughs> but, but the thing of it is, is when you have that responsibility, you have a responsibility to be able to teach people in the right way. And so you got to take some time to study that. It's like this. I wouldn't be able to preach this unless I studied this. This is a weird passage to preach on, okay? Give me that credit at least. But, every time I read the passage, I said, Lord, help open up my eyes and help open up everyone else's. So I know that this is bathed in the power of the Spirit. But the thing is, we see in our world today, that we oftentimes want to trade our helplessness for hopelessness. <laughs> Jay had a beautiful testimony today because he didn't trade his helplessness for hopelessness. He connected and he made his life right with the source that can help him in his walk. Amen. Amen. Give God praise for that. <laughs> My second point, and I'm going to try to get through this quickly. There's a lot to it, so bear with me. But my second point is this. Without the Holy Spirit's help, you're helpless. And everything that is divine, which means everything that's godly, it's impossible. It's impossible. Human effort alone can't produce divine effects in our lives as much as we want to do that. Human efforts alone will not save you. <laughs> Human efforts alone will not send you to heaven. Human efforts alone will not <laughs> help you be the witness that you can be to others. It will not give you the craving of your soul. And it will not satisfy the things that you need in your life. Being the spiritual creatures that God made us to be to be made in his image and to be also his image bearers of who he is. In fact, this is why we need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us from the time that we're born to help understand the provenient grace of God. In Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, it talks about the, he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. You see, the Zerubbabel may have not understood at that point in time in history why the temple was not starting to build itself. Because Zerubbabel also had to understand that God has his own time to build and to work things for his good. And so God used Zechariah to speak to him proveniently. Show him that provenient grace, even in this verse, saying it's not going to be by that. It's going to be by the Spirit of the Lord. And today he shows us that provenient grace within our lives. From the time that we're born, I believe that there's all kinds of signs and witnesses and people that we interact with, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, that God so desperately tries to show who he is and his power and his spirit to us. Before we even come to an acknowledgement of the cross and of Jesus as Savior, we believe that God has this provenient grace that wants to speak to us, to show us who He is. 
And it takes the Holy Spirit to reveal that to us. The Holy Spirit also takes up residence in who we are. And it comes right at that moment when we accept the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 16, it says this. It says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? Huh. And that God's spirit dwells in your midst? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says this also. It says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Isn't it so interesting? Zerubbabel was a building is interested in building this physical temple. But here God is saying, that's great and all. But the temple that I desire, it's not a building, it's you. He wants to reside in you. And that's something you can't give to yourself. It's something that is divine that comes from the hand of God. For God and His Spirit to be able to come and to work and to move and to be able to move out everything that's sinful, everything that's dark, everything that's black, everything that goes against the Word of the Lord. He comes in, He cleans you up. He gives you a victory and He gives you a new life and a new start. Amen. Amen. Woo! He bought you with the cross. And He wants to live inside of you. Woo! That's some good preaching right there. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. He spoke that word. The Holy Spirit also helps us as we talk about our testimony to others. You may have not known that, but as you testify about God in your life, the Holy Spirit comes to work and is he uses you to speak to others. In fact, it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 16, it says this, it says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. If you were bought with a price, he's put his stamp on your life. And when you speak about him, he uses your life to testify to a better life in the spirit with him. Here's the thing. When's the last time that you gave God five minutes of your time to let him use your mouth, <laughs> to let him use your life, to let him use your hands and feet to testify about the goodness and graciousness that he offers instead of complaining and murmuring and bickering? When's the last time that you did that? Because when you're filled with the Spirit, you testify to the Spirit that's within you. When you're filled with everything else, guess what? You move God out of the way, and then you begin to complain. You begin to murmur. You begin to focus on all of the things that are worrisome. All of the things that the enemy wants you to focus on. All of the things that distract you from your purpose. But when you let the Spirit in, it kicks that to the curb testifies of himself through you. Give God a praise for that. The Holy Spirit comes to our hearts to also give us renewal and transformation of our minds. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13 says, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Romans 12 2 also says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You can't bring that kind of transformation into your heart and life all on your own. You can do all the exercise, all the Pilates. You can do all of the Bible reading that you want to. You can do all of the spiritual exercises. But until you begin... To let the Spirit transform your heart and life from the inside out. It's all just motions of life. Because what God wants is to change and rewire your whole being into yes. being more like His. Give me a The Spirit also dwells with us, it dwells with each believer. 
seeking to reproduce the character of who Christ is. Galatians 5, chapter, or chapter 5, verse 22 through 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit whoo, is this love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. And against such things, there is no law. When you let the Spirit take control of your life, this is what you're going to be almost guaranteed to be more like. Who doesn't want to be more loving? Good, you didn't raise your hands. That's great. <laughs> Who doesn't want to be more joyful? Who doesn't want to have more peace in your life? Who doesn't want to have forbearance or kindness or goodness or faithfulness or gentleness? Now here's the hardest one. Self-control. Self-control. You're not going to have any of that without the help of the Holy Spirit in your life. God wants to make you more like Him. And I just think that is amazing. It brings me to a place of awe and worship for Him. Give God praise. The Spirit, it also engages us as believers for service. It makes us strong to struggle against the evil that's in this world. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says this. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And we get that by reconciling our helplessness to the Lord. And when we reconcile our sinful ways and we ask the Lord into our heart, you will be stronger than you ever have been in your life. Because your helplessness leads to the help and the power of the Almighty. And it's with his help. You're going to be ready to do battle with that old devil. Not through your will, not through your mind, not through your power, but through the power of the Holy Spirit working within you. And you're going to be energized in ways that you never thought you would be. It doesn't matter what storm is blowing in through your life. You're going to be ready to dig into the Word of God every day. You're going to wake up to the word of God, you're going to be thinking prayers. You're going to be able to pray out adoration unto the Lord. You're going to be able to confess. You're going to be able to be in a mode of thanksgiving. And then you're going to take that bulletin and you're going to start praying for all those things on the back of that every single day. Yeah. You're going to be empowered. You're going to be ready. The Holy Spirit also calls believers into the harvest fields for witnessing opportunities. If we look at Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, it has a list of all kinds of names. It says, in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. We need more of those in our life today. Prophets and teachers. There's Barnabas, <coughs> Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Mannion, who was brought up with Herod, Petrach and Saul, while they were there worshiping the Lord and fasting, see, they were in worship. <laughs> the Holy Spirit said this, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they had placed their hands on them and sent them off. We need more of that within our church today. We need more prophets. We need more <laughs> teachers. We need more people speaking the word so others can hear and understand. Because with the help of the Holy Spirit, you're not so much concerned about as to where you're going. You're more concerned with, Lord, is this where you're leading me? Okay? <clears throat> you might be helpless right now in your witnessing to someone, but I guarantee you, the Lord will use your life to speak to others. Lastly, the Holy Spirit also seeks to teach us the truth of God as it's revealed and taught by Jesus Christ himself. In John chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus said this, he says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. And in John chapter 16, he said, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. The truth 
that he speaks about proof that the Father God does not intend that we labor in human vain in strength alone to carry out the gospel message. It's not his will that we experience the disparity of failure. He's provided for us here today the help of the Holy Spirit. So we don't have to be helpless. And all of these things are only accomplished through the power of the Holy Ghost. Give God praise. Amen. My third point, my last overall point is this. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, how can believers experience His glory? How can believers experience His glory? One of the questions we always get asked as preachers is, how come we don't see more evidence of God in, in our daily lives? <laughs> and sometimes I just simply say, because I think some people would rather talk the talk and not walk the walk. I think we would rather talk about the glory instead of experiencing it for ourselves. You see, believers have to believe that they have and received the power of the Holy Spirit when they respond to the gift of the cross. When they respond to that gift, we can know that we have the power, the resurrecting power working within us. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 through 20 again says this, just to reminisce. Do you not know? Ask us a question. That your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you. Whom you have received from God. Because you're not your own. You're bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Honor God. Let His Holy Spirit take you to your next assignment. We need to be in our lives consumed with asking for the fullness and the power of the Spirit. In Luke eleven thirteen, 13, it says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Have you ever asked for the gift of the Holy Spirit within your life? I'm not talking about some crazy stuff that like they do in another church where they drink poison and eat snakes or something like that. What I'm talking about is the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life in such a way to where you have nothing else leading you but His Spirit. To where you are almost uncomfortable, but you're comfortable because you know who's leading you. God is your Father. And the great thing is all you have to do is ask Him. Obedience to the known will of God is one of the essentials for the fullness of the power of the Spirit. In Acts 5.32, it tells us that we are witnesses of these things. <laughs> so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey. To those who trust. Your helplessness through the power of God. It guarantees you a victory that Jesus won for you on the cross. Your obedience to God, it guarantees you a victory over a life of sin. Because when you become obedient to the Lord and you walk in His ways, and I know you know this, but to re-articulate how important obedience is, is if you're following God, guess what? You're not going to be following the other guy. If you're following God, you're not going to be following that other guy, the enemy. So in conclusion, to bring this back to my original story, In that moment with that car accident, I had never felt more helpless. I didn't know if there was anything that I could do. But there was one thing that I could do. And by the Spirit's prompting, I began to pray for this woman. All bloodied. Her car is messed up. She's asking about a baby. I didn't see no baby. I'm scared. But by the Spirit's prompting, I began to just pray. I began to pray. And I prayed, and I, I just didn't stop. And for 10 minutes, I was just praying and praying and praying. Somehow within my prayer, another car stopped. 
And he started to ask, what's going on? And I said, well, this is what I know. And he said, hey, I, 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 got, I got a direct line to my buddy. He's, he's in the sheriff's department. And then like five minutes later, then finally, you got the sheriff. And then you got paramedics. I prayed for that woman's life to be spared that day. And the Lord answered that prayer. They had found her child. His life was spared as well. So I urge you today to know that when you feel completely helpless, and you will, that the Lord is surely a prayer away. And don't stop. Don't stop praying. Don't stop. Because the Spirit will be there to guide, to lead, to comfort, to be able to help you to know what to do, to help something come into mind to where you, man, I didn't remember that for 10 years and the Lord just brought that back to mind. I didn't know what to do for this woman other than to pray. And I'm here to testify that God worked through that prayer. She's taken to, of course, the hospital ambulance. Of course, for privacy issues, there's not much else that I know. I do know because the newspaper had written a little article. This woman had taken so many drugs. She was so out of her system. She, by all accounts, should have never have made it. But God, God, let's stand today. The question of it all today is, do you want help today? More specifically, do you want the Lord's help? Sometimes we don't like to be helped within our lives, but for me, this message is prompted by understanding of how helpless we are without the work and power of the Holy Spirit. Let's bow our heads today and pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this word. And we thank you for us gathering here together today. Lord, I, I pray that this message somehow speak to those that are in the house and online and wherever they're watching from, even later in the week, Father, I pray that you use this message to speak about how helpless we really are in life, how fragile we really are. But Lord, we know that it's not through our might, it's not through our strength, and it's not through our power, but it's by the Spirit, your Spirit, that we're able to do the miraculous and the impossible. Lord, I have seen you brought people who should have been dead back into life. I've seen you bring people who were so far on the edge and you brought them back into your hand. So Lord, my prayer today is that for all of us to be able to have a moment or a testimony of testifying of those same things within our life. How we can see our friends or family or neighbors, people around us, Father, who they're on the brink of something, but Lord, you brought them back. Lord, may your Holy Spirit testify and speak through us here today. I pray this as we leave. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 May the Lord bless you in your life today. You guys are dismissed. Hey, thank you so much for listening to our podcast today. If you would like to connect with me or Greencastle Church of the Nazarene, you can find us on Facebook at Greencastle Nazarene and also on our website, www.greencastlenazarene.com. May you have a blessed and wonderful day in the Lord.